We're so glad you're here. I want you to know, please be in prayer for the golf tournament tomorrow. I, set, I asked at 9.30 that we pray for no rain, and I just looked outside. So maybe we need this group to pray for no rain because that definitely didn't work with the 9.30 crowd. And uh, we're gonna have a great time. I want you to know there's a Wit and Wisdom event with Maisie Robinson. You definitely wanna check out. It's open for the entire church. It's on the church website. And also there's a grief support group beginning this afternoon with Dr. Randy Jackson. It's gonna be via Zoom. There's a lot of people struggling with grief and we want to be taking care of those folks. So if you or somebody you know might be in that position, invite them to be a part of that great group. But for now, let us worship together. I invite you to stand, either in body or in spirit, as we worship together, and I invite you to start by reading these words responsibly with me as God calls us to worship. When the world around us seems to be shaking, God's love is our foothold, which shall not be moved. When the life within us is dry and parched, God's word is our wellspring, our fount of living water. Let us worship the one who offers us wisdom and teaches us how to serve. Let us worship together in song. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream and our mouths were filled filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy then they said among the nations the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the desert. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with sheaves and songs of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we're glad. We are glad. We are glad. Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Every 
song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Show. Sure. 
Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, guys. Well, again, welcome to Roswell Presbyterian Church. It's great to be in worship with you this morning. We're so glad you're here. Today, we're going to continue our sermon series looking at the book of Acts. As Luke tells the story of the early church, what gathered them together, saying that one of the important themes of the book is that we are better together. It's important for us to be together. But one of the questions that confronted the church is who counts in that togetherness? What does it take to be a part of the church? So one of the first questions that really confront the church is, you know, initially the early church was Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But then eventually, Gentiles who are non-Jews begin hearing the story, the good news of Jesus Christ, and they begin trusting them. And so the question became, do Gentiles, non-Jews, have to become Jews first and then they can become Christians? Or can Gentiles just become Christians straight away? Because if they had to become Jews first, the males would have to be circumcised. You have to follow kosher food laws, Le- Levitical laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so this was an important question that really confronted the early church. And today's text recounts them having a discussion about it and where they conclude and how they answer it. So let us open our hearts and minds to listen to God's word from Acts 15, verses 6 through 21. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he made no distinction between them and us. Now therefore, Why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David which has fallen. From its ruins, I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I've reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask that in the next few moments you might be our teacher, that you by your spirit might speak a word only you can speak. And today, Lord, I really do think it's true that we hear a unique word about the difference God revealed in Jesus Christ made for the early church, but also for us. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in our sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Every time I step into an elevator, I think twice. After the end of the Cold War, I was in college and went with a group of college students to Russia. We are doing culture camps there in Russia. We were staying in Irkutsk, Siberia, on the shores of Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal is the largest freshwater lake in the world. One day, a group of us guys wanted to go across town to see a family that lived in one of these kind of old, rundown communist apartment buildings. And let me tell you, the communists were not known for their beautiful architecture. Okay. We got on the elevator. The family lived on... Uh, The family lived on um, the sixth floor. And so we got on the elevator, we hit six. 
and this like rickety elevator starts going up, right? And then it starts to lurch and jerk, to shake. And then out of nowhere, it drops what feels like a thousand feet. We're terrified. We're looking at each other going, this is it. This is how we're going to die. We're dangling by some communist thread hovering over the abyss. And we didn't know Russians, so we couldn't call for help. No elevator engineers were with us, so we didn't know what to do. And so we said, we got to save ourselves. And so we pried the doors open. And then we could see there was a little ledge. And so we we climbed out of the elevator and onto the floor to safety. We breathed such such a sigh of relief. We're saved. We saved ourselves hanging in the balance. We're safe. We saved ourselves. Six months later, I was living in Seattle, Washington, working at Wolfgang Puck's restaurant as a busboy. I wiped tables, washed dishes, ran errands, and got made fun of. I also was responsible for taking the trash out at the end of the night. So one night around 11 p.m., I gathered all the trash, took it to the elevator, and I pushed B. Now, I pushed B because the trash compactor was in the basement. And so it begins to descend, and all of a sudden it begins to lurch and jerk, and it drops. And I thought, not again. I got lucky the first time. I'm going to die this time. I know I'm dangling from a thread that was given to the to lowest bidder. And there I was dangling. So you know what I did? I tried to open the doors, but I couldn't pry these capitalist built doors open. And there I sat. And this was before I had a cell phone. And so I'm really trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And then I look and there's a, there's a telephone. And so I grab the telephone. And I call and there's this operator says, can I help you? I said, I'm in Seattle, Washington, in an elevator at Wolfgang Puck's restaurant. I need help. I need someone to come save me. She says, sir, someone will be t- to you quickly. I'm sending a technician. Quickly was like an hour and a half. I sat in this elevator with the trash, mind you, waiting for someone to come save me. Eventually, the technician came, worked his magic on the outside. The doors opened. I got off safely. I was so relieved I'd been saved. Spiritually, I think many of us assume that we are in elevator number one, when in reality, we are in elevator number two. Elevator number one, we think we can help ourselves, we can save ourselves, but we are in reality in elevator number two. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Before what we know now about him, he kind of gave a little window into his moral outlook, the writer and director Woody Allen used these words to describe our culture's spiritual predicament. He writes, more than at any other time in history, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, the other to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. This is the human condition. This is our predicament. What can we do when we can't help ourselves? Sometimes we can pry the doors open and we can get get to safety. But there are times we cannot get the doors open when we cannot save ourselves. It is a tendency for humans to think we are in elevator number one when in actuality we are in elevator Number two, this is as true for us as it was for the earliest Christians. This is the question that confronted the early church. What do we have to do to save ourselves? What do we have to do to be saved? This is the religious question. Unless you do blank, you cannot be saved. The first century, in this Jewish community, they were saying, well, you had to be circumcised, you had to eat certain foods, wear certain clothes. In our days, similar questions. Do certain things, believe certain things, go to certain places. 
This is the human predicament. How can we help ourselves? I told, oh God, sorry about this. I feel like, God, what, did I say something wrong? <laughs> I told you a few weeks ago uh, that Pew came out with a study. 75% of Americans believe that the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. I keep reading in there, but I can't find it. This is one of the great misconceptions of Christianity. And this is not a new idea. This is as old as humanity. How can we save ourselves? How do we get ourselves out of the mess we're in? This has been one of the, the central questions that the church has fought over since the beginning. In the fifth century, a young Christian moved from the British Isles to Rome. He wanted to study law. He was a brilliant mind gifted writer, and extremely self-disciplined. When he got to Rome, he was shocked by the moral laxity he witnessed. It so offended him that he gave away all his possessions and went to live in a monastery and became a monk. Aesthetic lifestyle, quite severe. And this guy believed that this call of what to live as a monk was not the requirement, not the calling of just monks. It was the call and requirement of every Christian. He had a strict view of the Christian life, that if there were moral demands, we had to meet them. He had a famous saying, he said, since perfection is possible, it is obligatory. Since perfection is possible, it is obligatory. Pelagius thought it was possible for us to live a perfect life, to be completely sinless. All we had to do was try harder. If you work hard enough, you can be perfect. Pelagius was a best, best-selling self-help author in the fifth century. His most famous work was this letter he wrote to a young woman named Demetrius. Demetrius, she had been engaged. She came from a really well-off family and she was engaged to be married but she broke it off to become a nun. Her parents were devastated by this, and so they wrote to Pelagius, and they said, would you write a letter to Demetrius, our daughter, and convince her to leave the monastery and go and be married to this man? And to their horror, Pelagius said no, and he wrote her a letter encouraging her, saying, become a nun. You can earn spiritual rewards. You can live a perfect life. You just have to decide you want to be perfect. And so Pelagianism began to spread in the ancient world. Then a great old bishop from Africa named Augustine stood up against this view. He saw it as both prideful and unrealistic about the human condition. He was famous for praying to God, command what you will and give what you command. Beautiful. Command what you will and give what you command. Augustine, time and time again in his writings, you'll find he returns to this image of a breastfeeding baby. He says that is the image of us with God, that we rely on God for sustenance. There's nothing we can do to help ourselves. It is God's goodness and God's grace, not our own moral, spiritual effort. Pelagius was stuck in elevator number one. And Augustine says, oh, we're in elevator number two. This is just as prevalent in our own day. If you read self-help material on, at Barnes & Noble or on Amazon, you'll see this theme. If you arrange your life in such a way and you try really hard, you can save yourself. The life you've always wanted, awaken the giant within, your best life now. You can help yourself. But this approach, if we're honest, seems impossible. Augustine used to love to quote John 15, 5, where Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. God says, moral effort can't save you. What can save you is trusting in Jesus Christ and God's good news revealed in Christ. And when we realize this great truth, God's grace flows out of our lives. We become more compassionate and merciful slower to anger, abounding in love. 
When we encounter people's mistakes and messiness, we learn to show grace because grace has been shown to us. But this is a, this is a tough, tough way to live out. It's tough to believe. It's a perennial question. What can I do to save myself? Unless you do blank, you cannot be saved. It's a persistent question. In fact, in the Middle Ages, an extremely complex and profitable religious system developed. It profited from the desire for people to save themselves. People could buy what they called indulgences, which were these little certificates that could get you or someone you love, a relative, absolved of a confessed sin. And so if somebody had already died and they were stuck in purgatory, you could buy indulgences to get them out of purgatory. You don't have to be Warren Buffett to see how you can make a lot of money this way. When the church wanted to renovate St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the D Dominican friar, Johann Tetzel, went around selling indulgences. And like any ma ad man, he had a good slogan. He said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> Unfortunately for Johann, his business took him to the parishioner's of the great priest Martin Luther. Luther worried that these indulgences would distract his congregation from the true source of their salvation, God's grace. Now many of us have assumed that we have progressed beyond buying indulgences, but I think it's true in our culture. We think we can acquire, we can buy things that will make us happy, things that will satisfy us, things that will make us feel saved. But we know that finite things cannot fill up an infinite desire. Try to, <laughs> just bought a new car. <laughs> oh, it's gonna make me so happy, then it got scratched. I'm like. <laughs> Luther said, put our faith and trust in the eternal God revealed in Christ. Luther described faith this way. Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. If moral effort can't save us, if looking and owning material possessions can't save us, is there anything we can insert into? Unless you do this, you cannot be saved. When this question confronts the early church, did you hear what Peter said? Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as you will. The church had the wisdom and the courage to put God's grace revealed in Jesus Christ at the center of the story, at the center of their community. So why can Jesus alone save us? It's because of who we believe he is. I'm gonna close with a parable. Let's say it's like die hard. <laughs> and you find yourself hanging in an elevator shaft and the doors are open just beyond your reach. You can see a light coming in. And you begin to help, yell, help me, somebody help me, somebody help me. And two people come to the rescue. And we're gonna analyze their help kind of philosophically, okay? So you're yelling, help me, help me. And guess who comes to the edge? Susie. Sweet Susie, she's a four-year-old at the Roswell Presbyterian Church Preschool. Everybody adores her, she obeys whatever her teacher says. She shares, she's kind, she's encouraging. Everybody loves her. And she's so, she's so gracious and generous. Even now, in the elevator shaft, she reaches down, she says, here, take my hand. Do you take her hand? Why? Because she's not strong enough, right? She's, no matter how sweet and kind and good and gracious she is, she's not strong enough to help. So there you are, dangling in the elevator shaft. 
So you get, continue to yell, help, help, help. And guess who comes this time? Your high school calculus teacher. You always knew he didn't like you ever since he failed you. You also remember that he was a football coach, strong guy, but he always made fun of you, called you wimpy. So he walks over. There's a little shadow behind his eyes. And he says, here, take my hand. And you kind of go to grab it, and then he pulls it away. He says, no, I won't pull it away this time. Here, grab it. <laughs> Do you take it? No, you can't trust him. Is he good? Is he trustworthy? It's the same predicament in our spiritual lives. The only one we can trust is Jesus Christ because God is powerful, but in Christ we also hear he is good. God is both powerful and strong and good and gracious and can help us. And if we will put this at the center of our lives and our community, this can transform us. It transformed the early church with Peter and Paul, transformed Augustine and Luther. It can transform us when we come together and put God's grace and goodness at the center. We are better when we are together. Let's pray. Gracious, loving God, we thank you that you are both strong and you are good. And Lord, we want to put our faith and trust in you that you could save us when we can't save ourselves. We thank you for that good news of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Indeed, how we need God. The scripture tells us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But as Jeff reminded us, scripture also tells us about a kind and gracious and powerful God who forgives us. So then we come together on a day like today and we pray asking God to forgive us, knowing indeed that that gracious, powerful, loving God will do that. So this morning then, as a family of faith and a body of Christ, let's pray together using the prayer that's printed in your worship guide. O Christ who prayed for us, died for us, and lives for us, you taught us that we belong to you, and your word is our truth. Forgive us, O Lord, when we live as if we belong only to ourselves. Forgive us, O Lord, when we foolishly think that power is the ultimate truth. Speak your words of peace to us this day and make our lives a testimony to your grace. Amen. So then here, this good news that scripture tells us that it was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us, not once we had pried the doors open and gotten out on our own, put our lives back together, 
that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And in the death and resurrection of Christ, the old is gone and the new has come. Friends, the good news is this, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant which is poured out for you in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, this is the feast of God for the people of God. What we'll do is Julie and I will each have a spot up here and then we have two elders, one who will be on each side back there. And then if you um, prefer not to come toward an elder for whatever reason, you may stay in your seat and Chad will come around with the elements and you can receive communion in your seat. So when you feel so moved, you can come to a station to pick up your communion. It's a little packet, so you peel off the top to get the wafer and then you peel off the foil to get the cup. It's our COVID-friendly way of continuing to gather together and to celebrate. When you, if you prefer gluten-free, we have gluten-free basket that's here on the table and you can come and receive the gluten-free from there. Friends, let's continue to worship. <laughs> i 
Friends, I invite you to stand either in body or in spirit as we continue to worship together in song. I'm gonna live so God can use me. turn. (laughs) Indeed, it has been good to be together and worship together. And so as we go from this place, indeed, may God use us, but also may we live out that, that grace and love of knowing a God who saves us, who's powerful and gracious to save us. So as you go from this place on this day, may the Holy Spirit go ahead of you to guide you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to be your friend, over and below you to sustain you, May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and forevermore. Amen.